Hello and welcome to the ISS contact between the Copernic Observatory and Science Center and Chris Cassidy on the International Space Station. My name is Drew Desker. I'm director of the Copernic Observatory. And our contact will start in about uh, a little over 20 minutes, but I wanted to do a very quick orientation for you about uh, this program and, uh, and what we do up here at Copernic. Again, the Copernic Observatory was founded back in 1973 to commemorate Copernic's 500th birthday. Uh, the Copernic Society, a group of Polish immigrants, people of Polish heritage here in the uh, southern tier, uh, decided uh, they wanted to do something more than uh, plunk a statue in a park and say, congratulations, Copernic, for being 500 years old. So they built the observatory. Uh, we are a uh, informal STEM education facility with four permanent telescopes. You can see on here, we've got three uh, scopes and domes. We also have a telescope that's called a heliostat that is uh, specifically designed to look at the sun. And um, again, we do a number of uh, programs throughout the year. Uh, our biggest program is, of course, our, our big summer programs, uh, which we are in the middle of right now. But we also do uh, school programs, uh, and scout programs, and public programs for the public, uh, where people come up to Copernic for a public program on some aspect of science or technology. And then if it's clear, we open up our domes and people get a chance to look at uh, the heavens through our professional telescopes. As I had mentioned, uh, we do uh, summer camps. And uh, this is actually the 28th year of summer camps that we've done. That's part of the uh, LINK Summer STEM Exploration. Uh, LINK is actually part of, the, uh, part of the LINK Foundation that helps us underwrite this program. Uh, Edwin LINK, you might remember, uh, invented uh, flight simulators and the whole uh, simulator industry, as it were. And uh, the, the Link Foundation is looking to uh, make sure we have uh, another bumper crop of engineers coming through so they help us uh, with what are some of our programs. Normally, we would have the kids up here during the summer, but uh, because of the pandemic, we are doing our program virtually this year. So we've offered camps for uh, students in grades two through nine, uh, topic, talking about topics on uh, like astronomy, uh, biology. We've done various forms of coding, uh, some engineering of sorts, uh, construction uh, engineering. We actually started to do a uh, camp on virtual reality, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we've done uh, programs on weather as well. And, uh, but our final program for this summer season is the one we're doing right now. It's called Welcome Aboard the ISS. This is uh, for students that are uh, entering a fifth and sixth grade. Uh, we're using, again, because we're doing this all virtually, we're using a video conferencing service to allow us to uh, uh, make this all happen. Uh, during the camp, uh, the students have learned uh, what does it take to become an astronaut, uh, what, uh, what kind of training they go through as the training for their missions. Uh, but then we also get into some, some nuts and bolts. Uh, we're going to have to track satellites, specifically the ISS. And how do we do that? How do we track the satellites across the sky? We also, how are we going to co communicate to them over the radio? Uh, and we talk about how the, how the radio works as well. Uh, we, what's been great about this particular camp is that uh, we've had students from uh, really, you know, from a wide range of, of locales. We've had people from out in Illinois, uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and all over New York State. So uh, it's been great uh, to have them, uh, have them with us. So this program is actually, uh, it's called ARIS, which is uh, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. And that is what's allowing us to talk to Chris Cassidy uh, on the space station. Uh, ARIS is actually a, the longest running experiment on the International Space Station. It's actually been on the space station since uh, the year 2000, although actually there's been uh, ham radio on, the, uh, on, on spacecraft as, as early in the 1980s. Uh, Owen Garriott uh, had uh, uh, ham radio on the, uh, on the space shuttle, and also uh, uh, we also had it on, on the Russian uh, space station Mir. Now, in order to get uh, an opportunity to speak uh, to the astronaut, you actually have to um, um, make a proposal to the ARIS uh, group and talk about what kind of your educational goals are. And if that aligns with what they, uh, what they would like to see happen, then we can, um, we'll, we're offered a spot. We've been very fortunate to, uh, to be able to do that. And let's see, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so um, 
Again, I'm a ham radio operator, and uh, we're using the ham radio station that we have here at Copernic, but we also have to have astro hams. We actually have to have the astronauts that are on the space station be licensed as amateur radio operators. And uh, here at Copernic, uh, over the past 10 years, we've been very fortunate to have uh, had uh, five other uh, contacts. Uh, the first one in the upper left-hand corner is Doug Wheelock, and Doug is particularly special to us here at Copernic because he grew up 15 miles from here. And uh, so it was great to uh, have him as our, at least my, certainly my initial uh, ISS contact. Uh, after that, we had uh, Mike Hopkins. Uh, you, you see him in the, uh, in the cupola. Then uh, we actually spoke with a Russian cosmonaut, uh, uh, Gennady Padelko. And uh, what was fun about that particular contact was that we actually had one of our students who was a native Russian speaker. And at the end of the contact, we ran out of questions. And uh, so uh, our, one of our students was actually able to uh, thank him in Russian for his time. And he was uh, quite pleased with that. So it was nice to, uh, to, uh, to have had that uh, way to sort of you know, brighten his day a little bit. Uh, finally, down in the middle, uh, Jeff Williams, uh, we had back in uh, 2016, and finally, uh, Serena uh, Chancellor uh, in 2018. Uh, this year, however, we are going to be uh, moving on, and our next uh, astronaut, uh, uh, hamstronaut, if you will, is uh, Jeff, um, I'm sorry, Chris Cassidy. Chris Cassidy will be our, our uh, uh, astronaut that we'll be talking to uh, uh, this afternoon. So what I want to do, though, is I want to show you a little bit of uh, information about um, ARIS and, uh, and what, what's about to happen. Hi, my name is Ruth. And my name is Chris. You must be pretty excited to talk directly with astronauts on the International Space Station today. While we're waiting for the space station to come over your portion of the sky, let's talk a little bit about how it's going to happen. Of course, Mission Control is in contact with astronauts all the time, using a big radio with lots of fancy equipment. However, we're going to be using something very different today. We are going to use ham or amateur radio to talk directly to the International Space Station. When most people hear the word radio, they think of a music radio station. But it's so much more than that. Radio actually refers to the unseen energy that transmits all sorts of signals using electromagnetic waves. At first, people learned how to send signals like Morse code. And then they discovered that you can send so much more, like data, computer signals, and even TV. Maybe you don't realize it, but you use radio every day. Maybe you watched the TV this morning, or you texted your friends, or maybe even you check social media like Twitter or Instagram. Let's travel back to space for a minute. Since the beginning of the space age, humans have sent many spacecraft out into the universe. These range from the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth daily, and the Curiosity rover exploring Mars. We've even sent a long-distance messenger, the Voyager 1, who has traveled outside of our solar system. Whether it's capturing a great picture of a far-off galaxy or conducting experiments on the space station, radio has to do with all of these. And today, you're going to be using ham radio. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is ham radio? Amateur or ham radio is a service and a hobby where operators can talk with people around their neighborhoods, their cities, their country, and even around the world. Amateur radio operators require a radio license from the government. They're not that hard to get. I have one. My call sign is KM4LAO. And mine is KD8YVJ. Our call signs are a way of identifying who we are to other operators. This lets everyone know that we have the proper license to using the radios. As amateur radio operators, or hands as we are often called, we can talk with others about basically whatever we want, often science or some new radio gadget that we are interested in. Let's focus back to the space station and your contact today. Many of the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the space station are licensed ham radio operators. That's why your operators today can contact them. The people here, as well as the astronauts, are licensed to talk to each other, and you are allowed to talk over to their radio. For our conversation today, we'll need an amateur radio station on the ground, either in this location or somewhere else around the world. We'll also need a radio in the space station. NA1SS, NA1SS. You can hear the calls coming. 
This is November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, the International Space Station. Over. On the space station, the radio transceiver is connected to an amateur radio antenna mounted on the outside. One of these antennas will be used today during our contact. For our side of the contact, we need a good sized antenna, a signal amplifier, something to make our signal stronger, and a rotator for turning our antenna. We have to keep our antenna pointed right at the International Space Station. And remember, it's moving across the sky and fast. To aim the antenna properly, we need to track the path of the space station exactly. NASA uses complex systems to track the path of the space station and other orbiting objects. The satellite tracking program we are using works out a complicated set of mathematics to provide the orbital location of the space station moment by moment as it moves through space. This information is sent to the computer that controls the antenna rotator, which moves the antenna to follow the space station. Maybe some of you have seen or worked with robotics. That's pretty cool stuff. And just like you can program a robot where to go, what to do, and how to get there, you can also program a computer to tell an antenna how to track the space station across the sky. You know, it took a lot of planning to get this contact. Several weeks ago, the ARIS operations team had to figure out when the space station's orbit would pass over this location. Then, they had to talk with the planners at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew's time is pretty full, so they were able to find a time that could work for the crew members' schedules. Once they found times that would work both in space and here on the ground, the host organized this contact. And in just a few minutes, you'll be hearing and talking to the astronauts. Well, it's almost time for your contact. It will be exciting, so good luck with it! All right, so uh, we're going to do uh, one more little video. This is actually, I'm going to show you a video of uh, a tour of Copernic's uh, radio station. So give me a moment and we'll, uh, we'll do that. All right, well, welcome to the lobby of the Copernic Observatory. We're going to take a tour out to the radio room and see what the radio system is going to be like. And uh, next time you come up here, maybe you can get yourself uh, on the landscape of Mars. Uh, on our way out there, you'll walk by our Astronaut Hall of Fame, where the, we actually have the four astronauts uh, that have grown up in this area. Uh, Dan Bursch from Vestal, Doug Wheelock from Windsor, Aline Collins from Elmira, and Doug Hurley from uh, Appalachian, who just uh, returned on the Crew Dragon uh, mission, uh, Demo 2 mission. So we're gonna head out the uh, double doors toward the telescopes, which is where our radio room is located down the hallway and enter the observatory where we have access to the three telescopes, our Sardin six inch uh, refractor telescope. We have a 14 inch reflector telescope there. We also have a 20 inch uh, reflector telescope, which we use for uh, imaging. And then this is the radio room. KJZRO is the Ham radio call sign of the station here at Copernic. And we're gonna walk right in. And this is the radio station. So the radio itself is this device down here with a, the green display. Above it is a rotor controller. And this is the uh, interface to the rotor that, does, that uh, changes both azimuth and the elevation. The box above it is the computer interface between the uh, rotor controller and the computer, and this is the computer that is doing the tracking. Right now you can see the ISS is actually uh, going uh, above the horizon right now, and we'll go out and take a look at the antennas and we should be able to see them moving. So we're gonna head out. Into, we got uh, some solar panels over here. And here are the antennas that are currently tracking the ISS. Of these uh, two antennas, uh, we're really only using the one on the right. That's the one that's cut for that particular frequency. And we should be seeing it move soon enough. 
as it's tracking. There it is, just a little bit. Just moves a little bit uh, from time to time. Every uh, it's constantly, you know, checking where it's located in the um, in the sky and making an adjustment so that we can track it through the entire pass of that we'll be uh, talking to uh, Chris Cassidy. And it, again, it has both an azimuth, which is the north, south, east, and west direction. Now let's see if I can get a slightly better view of it over here. There's sort of a, in this area right here, that's, uh, that's doing the, uh, the azimuth, uh, turning it uh, north, south, east, or west. And then there's another rotor right here that is rotating the antennas in whatever elevation is appropriate to connect uh, to the space station. So that is uh, what we'll be using as we uh, as we talk to Chris. And again, this is uh, some of the domes. The, uh, the gray one on the left is the 20 inch. The one on the right is our six inch. And the one in the, in the background there is our 14 inch reflector scope. So anyway, that is our uh, tour of the uh, radio station and uh, an antenna setup so that we have here for Copernic. All right, let's uh, go to the last uh, slide here. And um, eventually I'm gonna show you a different uh, screen that'll uh, have uh, a couple of different uh, windows in it. One of which is this one that looks like this. And this is a, a screen from our tracking program. The white disk that you're seeing here is what's called the satellite footprint. That's how much of the, uh, in, of the uh, Earth the ISS can see at any particular time. Uh, this little dot right here is our location. And uh, so you'll see throughout the contact, uh, the, the, this white disk will start to come and cover up. You know, so we are inside that white disk. And at that point, that's when we should be able to hear Chris Cassidy and he should be able to hear us. So uh, that is a brief orientation to what we're doing here. Uh, I am now gonna switch over to uh, our, we've got about, uh, about four minutes left between uh, now and when we should start hearing the, um, the ISS will be calling out. We've got a uh, ham radio operator by the name of Gary Dewey. His call sign is AB2GD. He is actually at the radio right now and is uh, making sure that all the audio comes bo for both from us, from our video conferencing service, and also from the radio back into the video conferencing service. So uh, we're going to stop our, uh, our ISS, uh, our uh, little presentation here. I'm going to give me a moment. I'm going to switch to the. All right, I apologize. I just, uh, I had myself muted here. So um, we are now uh, about ready to, uh, we probably get another three minutes, uh, three minutes or so before uh, the ISS should start to become uh, visible. So again, um, this uh, white disc that you see right here is the satellite footprint. That's how much of the earth the uh, ISS can see. Uh, we have a little dot right uh, just above my hand here that is, uh, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure you're actually seeing that, so I apologize. Um, so let me see if I can bring that up. And uh, yeah, this might be, so right, right in here is where, uh, where we are located. And the ISS is, is at, uh, right over British Columbia. Now these uh, students uh, have, have rehearsed a, a bunch, and, uh, but like everything else, we just don't know uh, exactly how well things are going to are going to work and uh so we'll uh um uh 
this is in fact our sixth uh, uh, sixth talk, and uh, let's hope uh, it'll continue to uh, uh, to be successful for us. Uh, uh, it's it's always exciting. Um, I, you know, I've been a ham for over 50 years, and I, I still have goosebumps. Uh, uh, you know, even just uh, preparing for this one here. So, uh, very much looking forward to it. Um, so we need probably another minute, minute and a half, and just before the uh, disc gets over our location, I'm going to have Gary uh, start uh, making his his uh, call. And once we establish connection, uh, our students will start to uh, ask their questions. And so, students, I take it you're all set, ready to go. And um, uh, it's a beautiful day here. Uh, fortunately, at Copernic, we're doing. Uh, a nice sunny day, although what's nice about radio is it could be cloudy, uh, it could be rainy, uh, and we still would be able to, uh, to operate. So uh, that's all working well. And let's see how we're doing. It's uh, 14.22, so I'd say we've got about a minute, well, a minute and a half, maybe two, up to two minutes. And um, uh, we were very fortunate uh, that uh, on this Expedition 63, uh, they had uh, two members of, uh, of NASA, two, two NASA astronauts, Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. Uh, they arrived on the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon. And uh, as it turns out, Bob Behnken is, is a licensed ham, uh, but Doug Hurley is from this area. And we had hoped maybe if he was still up there, we would uh, be able to uh, uh, say a quick hi to Doug, but he came back safely and we were just very happy about that. All right, Gary, so I think we're getting pretty close to where uh, we want to start maybe opening up the squelch, and uh, let's uh, have you make some calls and see uh, when we start hearing, uh, hopefully hear Chris uh, uh, come back to us. So uh, go ahead and, and place your first call, Gary. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is Kilo 2 Zulu Romeo Oscar. Do you copy? Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is Kilo 2 Zulu Romeo Oscar. Do you copy? Over. Good afternoon. We copy you and welcome to the Copernic Observatory and Science Center. Here is our first question. Go ahead, Tierney. Mrs. Tierney, are there any germs in space? Over. We do have germs in space. We've got people living in board a cold uh, space, and, and we, uh, we test and make sure that everything is safe. But every now and then, we do see some uh, evidence of, of growth because of uh, people, and we have uh, germs. Over. This is Philip. Could you see the launch of Perseverance or fireworks from the ISS? Over. We in the area to see the launch of Perseverance, so unfortunately we could not, and fireworks are very difficult to see. I tried a, a number of occasions to see a call that has been unsuccessful. However, if we are over the, uh, our cargo ship, for instance, that's launching to come to the space station, we can see, uh, see that rocket over. This is Hussein. Do astronauts carry smartphones with them in the ISS? Over. And, uh, we don't carry any smartphones with us. We do uh, carry around a tablet, which has our procedures and things. It's, it's only connected to the local area network. It's not connected to the normal internet. Uh, and we use it to, uh, to work on all our activities during the day. Over. This is Lily. What sort of people work with astronauts? Over. Hi, Lily. We have lots of different uh, people. We, there's trainers and uh, administrative folks, folks that help us with travel, folks that help us with preparing for the space station. There's all kinds of different folks that work at NASA in our various space partners. So I would say as many types of people as there are, so that's the type of people that we interact with. Over. This is Jeremiah. What is the temperature like in and outside of the space station? Over. 
So my inside the space station, we keep it very comfortable, about 72 or 3 degrees. And, and uh, so we just wear shorts and a t shirt, and, and we're, we, uh, it's like a comfortable space station is a different space. It, in the shade, it's about minus 200 degrees, and in the sun, it's about 200, 250 degrees. So it's quite opposite extremes uh, on the outside of the space station. Over. This is Audrey. Do you, how long have you been on the ISS? Over. Audrey, my two friends and I, we have been on board the space station for a little over four months, almost five months, and we have two more months to go. The three of us, Anatoly, Ivan, and myself, come home on October 22nd after seven months. Over. This is Antonio. Becoming an astronaut is an amazing life goal and accomplishment. What do you think you're going to do next? Over. Well, Antonio, I've been thinking a lot about this very topic, and uh, I think the first thing I'm going to do is get an RV and drive around the country with my wife and explore our amazing United States and all the beautiful places it has to offer before I think about anything else. Maybe do that for about a half a year. Over. This is Nebula. If the ISS is traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour, it seems very hard for ships to dock with it. It's hard enough to hit a ping pong ball going 10 miles per hour. How do scientists and astronauts plan and execute these dockings? Over. That's a very good question, Nebula. And, but in reality, it's about relative speed. So when we are going 17,000 miles an hour, our cargo ships also are going just about that fast. And so what matters most is the difference in speed between us and them. Imagine a car driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour. If you're staying on the side of the road, it seems to go by very quickly. But if you're driving adjacent to another car going 71 miles per hour, it seems like it passes very slowly. So that's the concept that we have here. Uh, relative speed is what's most important to us. Over. This is Eli. Do astronauts work on experiments from scientists from different countries? Over. Uh, yes, we have an internet. It's an international space station in all senses, including science. So uh, scientists from all over the world put together their plan, and then their experiment gets decided and chosen to fly in space. And then um, astronauts from all different countries will can work on that experiment uh, from whatever country it's in. It's an international team effort. Over. This is Genevieve. What are your views of Earth from the space station, and what else do you see when you look out? Over. Genevieve, just actually this morning, I saw your hurricane, Hurricane Genevieve, which is off the coast of Baja, California today, and, uh, and that is one of the things we look for is phenomena on the Earth, like hurricanes or large uh, volcanic eruptions, um, burning the Amazon, uh, rainforest, we can see those fires, and so that's what we look for. We look for what's happening on Earth that's interesting for scientists as well as for us. Over. Okay, this next question is for Nathan. Uh, Nathan's question is, how do you do liquid science experiments when you are working in space? Over. We often have work with liquid in, in when doing experiments, and, and we often work with liquid in our daily lives when we're drinking uh, water or, or uh, iced tea, for instance. And you just have to be very careful with, with the fluid. But what's, what really is important for liquids uh, is the surface tension. I don't know if you've learned that concept in your science classes, but it's the surface tension that makes the water turn into a, a, a circular, a spherical ball. And uh, that's something we often with an experiment with over. This is Josh. What happens when you have to sneeze while on a spacewalk? Over. Josh, uh, I've had that happen, and it can do one of two things. If you catch it in time, you can point your face down towards your neck, and, uh, and it'll go 
kind of below the level of your visor. But one time I sneezed and I did not make it in my, uh, all the stuff, all the boogers went uh, onto the inside of the visor. Not a pretty sight over there. This is Rianne. Do you have seats that you sit in and how do you stay in it? Over. I have seats up here. We stay floating and we use our feet to, to stabilize ourselves uh, when we need to be uh, still. And when it's time to sleep, we get in a sleeping bag and zip ourselves up. But uh, throughout the whole six months up here, we do not really ever sit in a seat over there. This is, this is Tierney. How do you choose what experiments to do? Over. We actually don't decide. The, there's a, a team of experts on the ground in Houston and Moscow and Japan and Germ in uh, Europe and Canada where they decide what the experiments will be. And when they get up here, the experiment is already uh, decided and the equipment is here and the procedure to do it is already here. And we, um, as astronauts, we execute those, those decisions by the other, the other people. Uh, that's how that's how it works. Over. This is Phil. Copernic is in upstate New York. Did Doug Hurley tell you lots about our area? Over. Well, Doug Hurley is a great friend of mine, and I've I've uh, uh, flown in space with him. This is my second time, so I'm very familiar with with his uh, part of New York where he grew up. And every time we fly over. Uh, the Finger Lakes in particular, we uh, both have, he tells me how to find his hometown from, from working at the Finger Lakes, and uh, yes, we've talked a lot about it over. This is Hussein. What do astronauts do in their free time? Over. Yeah, free time here in space, we generally like to look out the window and take pictures of Earth or the stars. We, that's our most... Uh, most of us think that we should take advantage of that while we can because in just a couple months we won't be here and we, we won't have that opportunity. Although we do have movies and books and musical instruments, we can do various other things, but looking out the window is our favorite thing to do. Over. This is Lily. How long did you have to train to become an astronaut? Over. The time I got first selected until I flew in space, my first mission was five years, and that's about average. The first two years, you are an astronaut candidate, learning, um, you're basically in school, and uh, then you're waiting, and, and then uh, my second mission, I had to wait another four years before uh, I, I flew again, so the, that's about how long, over. If there is, what's the sunset look like in space? Over. Well, we have 16 sunsets every single uh, day up here, and uh, it's unbelievable the colors that you see as the sun comes cresting around over the curvature of Earth. Uh, it, it, there's a few moments where you have this amazing sort of rainbow hue as, uh, as the sun's peeking its eyes over the horizon, and boom. It instantly comes alive as it pops up over. This is Audrey. When did you get interested in space? Over. I got interested in space from a friend of mine in the Navy who had gone on to become an astronaut. And talking to him, uh, that's what got me motivated. Over. This is Antonio. Who inspired you to be an astronaut? What qualities did they demonstrate that you admire? Over. NA1SS, this is Kilo 2 Zulu Radio Oscar. Thank you for the contact in 73s. All right. Well, we did it. Congratulations. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, we were very fortunate to uh, catch him right uh, as he came above the horizon. And then uh, in, uh, he didn't get a chance to uh, answer uh, uh, Antonio's uh, final question, but... Uh, um, this was a great, great opportunity for uh, for the students to, again, ask an astronaut uh, who's you know, in the middle of his job. Uh, you know, you know, I say take your kid to work, but you know, take your kid to the space station. And uh, so, uh, anyway, we hope uh, you enjoyed this as much as we did. Um, uh, 
hopefully uh, uh, ARIS will be able to support some uh, additional school uh, contacts you can uh, watch on the ARIS uh, uh, website and, uh, and this YouTube channel. And um, thank you again for watching. Um, it's now time to relax. <laughs> so long. <laughs>